All right, well, let's um, <clears throat> begin by reading John 10, which is the Good Shepherd Discourse. Jesus refers to himself as a shepherd, to his people as sheep, and that's why we are using the terminology of, of sheep. And these sheep, as I've said before, do not refer to all of ethnic Israel, do not refer to the entire world, not each and every individual, but the sheep refer to those that the Father has given Jesus, those that believe in him, and those who aren't sheep are basically said to be those who won't believe in him because they are not sheep, which again gives to us really, I think, the clearest view in Scripture of uh, the fact that, um, you know, unless God chooses us, we will not believe. So John 10, beginning in verse uh, 24, the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, again, there's a lot in here. We're going to look at it um, in, in the message uh, at differing points, so I won't go over it now. But hopefully you'll be able to follow this as, um, as I go along. Again, this is a little bit more doctrinal, a little bit more theological, although I tend to be that way most of the time anyway. Um, but it's because we're trying to show what the Bible teaches as over against another view, which we believe to be in error. In the same way that uh, when the Synod of Dort met in the 16th, uh, well, 17th century, the 1600s, that they saw these things and they also believed they were wrong. And being wrong, they again took something away from the credit that we should be giving to God. Now, as I already mentioned last week, we began looking at the Remonstrance, which was a document handed over by the followers of, of Jacobus Arminius, who was a teacher in the um, uh, University of Leiden okay, in the Netherlands in the 16th century. I think he may have made it into the 17th century. But his followers brought these five complaints, what we call the Arminian complaints. By the way, that's the where, where Arminianism gets its name is from the followers of Arminius and these particular views. And these were complaints against the Calvinistic Dutch church and their view on the matter of election. Now, we began looking at these things and we saw that the remonstrance agreed with the Dutch church that, that man is totally depraved. That because of the fall, that our entire being has been affected by sin. So that on our own, apart from God's help, we cannot because we will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because we don't want to do that, okay? Paul tells us in Romans 8, verse 8, and again, I'm just going to give you snippets just as a reminder, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Even the remonstrance said, if you could believe in God, that would be very pleasing to him. But we come into this world in the flesh, so we can't please God. Now, in a contradictory way, uh, they also at the same time believe that God gives a prevenient grace or basically help, a help that comes before faith, uh, the help of His Holy Spirit that we need to believe, that He gives this to all of us as we come into this world. And I'm assuming that means at conception because that's when we come into the world. And that means this, and we have to pay very careful attention here, that there is never a time in their view when we in this world do not have grace. Okay, So we come into this world, as soon as we're conceived, we get this prevenient grace, and this grace takes away our total depravity and gives us the ability to trust in Jesus. Okay, Now, if that's true, then it completely cancels out the, any idea of total depravity, right? Because total depravity means we're so bad 
that we can't choose Jesus. But prevenient grace means that we have enough goodness so that we actually can believe in Jesus. Okay? So where's the total depravity? It kind of vanishes. Now, most, most Christians today, most evangelical Christians today, that we would say if we're going to put them in one of two camps, Calvinism or Arminianism, who are Arminians, okay, would believe something similar to this, except they would just simply say, the fall has not completely destroyed our ability to believe in Jesus. We still have a little bit of goodness left in us, and we can choose him if the gospel is presented to us. But again, this doesn't agree with what the Lord says about us in his, in his word. Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead means we have no life, no spiritual life, no ability to move towards God. Okay? Now this view really cannot be right. Now think about this too. Think about how the Bible portrays us as totally depraved. And then think about the remonstrance view. Oh yeah, we agree, we're totally depraved, but at the very moment we're conceived, God gives us grace, and then we're not totally depraved. Well, if that's the case, why does the Bible describe us in the terms that it does? And why do those descriptions apply to adults and people who live their whole lives that way and eventually perish? They're not totally depraved in the remonstrance view because prevenient grace has wiped that out. But Paul says you're dead. You're dead until God makes you alive, and that making alive is what we're going to look at this morning. Now, the remonstrance also said that God chooses, He elects. They, they agreed with that. But their view was this, that as He looks down the corridors of time, He's going to see some who will, by His Spirit, by His help, with His prevenient grace, believe in His Son, and then continue in faith and holiness to the very ends of their lives, and God says, oh, that's pleasing, I'll choose them. They chose me, I'll choose them. But, you see, the Bible tells us God doesn't have to look ahead to see what it is we're going to do. He doesn't have to look down the quarters of time because God has, you know, infinite knowledge. He already knows. He knows we won't believe, okay, that apart from His grace, all we will do is hate Him. I mean, Paul, what does Paul say about us before we came to Jesus Christ, before he even sent Jesus into the world? He says, we were enemies. We were God's enemies. God was actually our enemy. I know sometimes that's hard to swallow, but that's what the Bible actually says. And yet, while we were still enemies, while we were still at odds with one another, Christ died for us. Jonathan Edwards went so far as to say, and this, this is... <laughs> He says some things sometimes that can kind of, um, they're shocking, and you've heard me say this before. But he went so far as to say that man would kill God if he could. And then you ask the question, well, how can Jonathan Edwards possibly know that? He says, because God came into this world, and man did kill him. They hung him on a cross, okay? Man hates God that much. So, God knows we would not receive him. Now, God also tells us that he does not give his spirit to everyone, but only to those whom he has chosen. And when they do, they come to Christ. We've already seen that. All the Father gives me shall come to me. But we're going to look at, the, at this a little bit more in just a few moments. Now, again, think about this. If God chose us because he saw that we would choose him and we would become holy and we would persevere to the end of our lives, that would make the choice our choice rather than his choice, right? Because he's choosing us only because we chose him. So it's our choice that is the determining factor. But that's not what the Lord says in his word. Paul writes this in Ephesians 1.4, He chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless. He didn't choose us uh, yeah, because we were holy and blameless. That's not what he says here. He doesn't say he chose us before the foundation of the world because we would be holy and blameless. He says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless, which means so that we would become 
holy and blameless. You can see that's not what the remonstrants believed, but that is what the Bible teaches. The only way we can become holy and blameless is if God chooses us, sends His Son for us, gives us a spirit to enable us to, to believe. When we believe in Him, then we become holy and blameless in Him. Now, that was just the review. This morning, I want us to consider their three remaining complaints. And this is their view, that Jesus died for each and every person who ever has or ever will live, that the grace God gives by His Holy Spirit can be resisted so that a person may not come to Jesus, and that it's possible once we have been saved, to lose our salvation. So in other words, we can trust in Christ, be born again, have all of our sins forgiven, and in the end, ultimately, be condemned forever at the final judgment. So let's consider, first of all, their belief that Jesus died for everyone. Now, they think, you know, if God gives everyone the ability to come through prevenient grace as they come into the world at conception, and He invites everybody to come, which He does, in fact, invite everybody to come, then He must have sent His Son into the world for everyone, and in a certain sense He did, but they think in terms of His actually having died for everyone. Now, I'm going to risk quoting what they said. This time I kind of updated it a little bit so it wouldn't be quite so hard to follow. Okay. But they say this, um, and I forget which article this is in. I forgot to include the reference. Okay. But they say this. There's only five of them, so it's not hard to find it. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, died for all men and for every man and has obtained for all of them by His death on the cross redemption and forgiveness of sins. Yet no one actually enjoys this forgiveness except the believer, according to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And 1 John 2.2. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So simply put, what they're saying is this. Jesus died for everyone so that all might have a chance at salvation, but only those who actually trust Him will be saved. Now, you know, this view is, is the common view. Most evangelical Christians believe this. This might be what we believed when we first came to Jesus. I know I did. I certainly believe this because this is what I was taught. This is what I thought I was reading in the Bible. But we really need to ask the question, is this really what God says? Now, Jesus tells us in what we read earlier in John chapter 10, uh, for whom he died, who it was he died for. He says in John 10 verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And who are these sheep? These sheep are those the Father has chosen to give him. Um, the ones he has chosen and he's chosen to give to him. He says in verse 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. So the Father gives Jesus the sheep. And these are the ones Jesus tells us that um, to whom the Father gives his Holy Spirit so that they actually will believe. They will come to Him and they will follow Him. Listen again to what Jesus says in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now again, in this same discourse, you know, this, this uh, sermon that Jesus preaches, He also makes it clear that, that everybody who was listening were not sheep. He said to those who did not believe in Him, Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. And then he goes on to say, if you were of my sheep, you would listen to me and you would follow me. Now again, I'm just going to point out something I pointed out many times before. I used to read this passage this way all the time. You are not my sheep because you don't believe. This is when I was an Arminian. If you just simply believe, you become a part of my sheep. No, you know, no problem. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you do not believe. 
the reason why you do not believe is because you are not of my sheep. If you were of my sheep, you would believe. Okay, do you, do you, I hope you see the point there. The point is not everybody is one of the sheep and only the sheep are going to believe and the sheep are the ones the Father gives to the Son and these are the ones He has chosen. By the way, this also explains why when Jesus prays in His high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, that He doesn't pray for the world, which I think if, if you're a remonstrant Arminian and you, you think, well, God gives this grace to everyone, He wants everyone to, to trust in Him and so forth, but Jesus doesn't pray for the world. He prays specifically for those people that are given to him by the Father, for those who have believed. Okay? So he says this in John 17, 9, I ask on their behalf, on, on behalf of, of my disciples who are following me now, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me for they are yours. And then he goes on to pray for those who will believe in the future. And he says in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So in other words, he's, pray he's praying in his high priestly prayer specifically for the people who believe and those people are the ones that the Father has given him, that belong to him. Now, the remonstrants object that this view contradicts John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. But it doesn't really contradict John 3.16 because what Jesus is telling us there is that God's love for a fallen world is so great that he sent his Son into the world so that whoever believes in him, whoever, shall not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't actually talk about for whom Jesus died. It just simply says he's sent into the world so that whoever believes in him. And certainly we believe that, as the remonstrants believe, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. But the real question is, who's going to believe in Jesus? It's going to be the sheep and the sheep only. Remember, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I mean, that, that's so perfectly clear. And when John tells us in his first letter in chapter 2, verse 2, that he himself is the propitiation, by the way, that's a fancy word for talking about satisfaction, atonement, where Jesus lays down his life to satisfy for God's justice, that he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and this is John talking about the Jews, you know, for, for those he's writing to, these believing Jews. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, when John says that, he's not saying that Jesus came to satisfy the sins of the entire world. Or only, but what he's saying is not just for the Jews, but also for people from every nation. Because that was something Jews had a difficult time with, was believing that Gentiles could be saved. I mean, we see that over and over again in the Bible. So he's not just for the Jews. He's also for the whole world. But it's not for each and every individual in the world. That's not what John is saying. Now think about this, and th this can be a real interesting point. Okay? Jesus could not have died for each and every individual because if he had, hell would have opened up and released all of its captives. As a matter of fact, we have to go further than that and say nobody would have ever gone to hell, right? Because Jesus' death would have covered all sins. Because his death on the cross applies backwards. See, which way is backwards for you? It applies backwards as well as forward, right? It, it, everyone who has ever been saved has been, has been saved by trusting in Jesus and has been saved by his death on the cross. It's retroactive and it's proactive, okay? So if his death had been for all men and had canceled out all sin, then nobody would have gone to hell. And the entire world would be saved, and the reason why we have to say that is because when Jesus died for sin, when he bore that sin and basically made a full payment, to satisfied God's justice, that sin was paid for in full. Okay? That means that those sins can no longer be counted against anyone, uh, anyone at least whose sins there were, they were. If I, uh, that sounds kind of confusing. But if any sin that was imputed or reckoned to Jesus on the cross has been paid for, 
and God cannot exact a double payment for it. So the point is that if Jesus had died for the whole world, everybody's sins would be canceled out. I had a professor actually in college who believed that. I mean, he saw the connection. Yes, if Jesus dies for all sins, everybody's sins must be forgiven. And so then, well, professor, <laughs> if that's the case, how can God send anybody to hell? That was my question. And he said, um, well, uh, because um, they're only going to be held accountable for one sin, and that is for, re for rejecting Christ. But, but Professor, I mean, this is my hand going up each time, uh, you know, the, um, not everybody in the world gets to hear the gospel. He says, well, that's right, but when they die, they get to stand before the Lord. The Lord will then share his gospel with them, and if they reject it, then they go to hell, but if they receive it, then they'll go to heaven. And I'm thinking, well, if you believe everybody has the ability to do this and everybody's going to have the opportunity to do this, why in the world wouldn't they do it, especially if they're looking at heaven and hell? You know, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. His, his death did not cancel out all sin, but it did pay for the sins that he was bearing, and those were the sins of the ones that the Father has chosen to give to Jesus. Jesus came to lay down his life for the sheep. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, that is the Father, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Now that's Paul writing to the Corinthian church, not to the world, but to the church. On our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's the sins of those who are chosen, who believe that are laid on Jesus, that he pays, and are entirely canceled out, and that is the reason we are saved. Okay, so we believe Jesus laid down his life only for the elect, only for the sheep, not for each and every individual. Because, again, if he did, that means the people who are suffering in hell right now are suffering for sins. That's like a double payment. The Lord would have already paid for them on the cross, but they're still suffering. And we know that can't be the case. God is just. He would never exact double payment. Now, let's get to the second matter of can God's grace by His Holy Spirit be resisted? Remember, the, the remonstrants believe that God's grace could be resisted. Now, let me give you a slightly paraphrased Article 4. Uh, this is what, this, these are just summaries of, of what they brought. It's not, not a complete thing. But it says what they mean. God's grace begins, continues, and finishes all good in us. So that even the true believer, without this prevenient or assisting, awakening, following, and cooperative grace, cannot think, will, do good, or withstand any temptation to evil. So that every good deed or action that can be imagined must be ascribed to the grace of God in Christ. But with regard to how this grace works, it can be resisted. It is written concerning many that they have resisted the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 7, and elsewhere in many places. By the way, I want you to notice the remonstrance here identified this grace as the only kind of grace God gives, the grace that... He gives to unbelievers and the grace he gives to believers. This, this is saving grace, okay? And they're saying that we can resist it to the point of actually perishing. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. Well, they're saying the Father doesn't give Christ to any particular people and not all of them are going to come anyway. Okay. So they're saying we need God's grace, we need His Spirit to be able to do anything good especially to trust in Jesus, because that's the ultimate good. But we can resist it to the point that we end up perishing. Now again, I mentioned earlier, we agree that there is a grace the Spirit gives that can be resisted, and that's His convicting grace. And that's what those in Acts chapter 7 were doing. They were resisting the Spirit's work of conviction. Okay? We also agree that, that as Christians, we... We still have sin in our hearts, and that sin resists what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. That's why we're not perfect. It'd be nice if we could just get rid of all that corruption and sin and be perfect and serve the Lord perfectly, but that isn't the case, so we can resist. But 
The point is this. If God gives us His Holy Spirit, we will come to Jesus. We will trust in Jesus. We will not perish. Now, listen to what the Lord says through Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 27. Hopefully, this doesn't get very technical, but here, the Lord is speaking about blessings He's going to give to Israel in the future. These blessings describe so perfectly what it is we're talking about here, God giving the Holy Spirit to give a new heart, to make them want to obey Him and trust Him and so forth. It is talking about new covenant blessings, but these new covenant blessings, remember, were given also throughout the old covenant to those who belonged to the Lord, to those whom He had chosen to give to His Son. So it's not exclusively new covenant. Remember, we were looking at the difference with R.C. Sproul between the old covenant and the new covenant. What is the difference? I mean, the same things are happening in both covenants. Well, the difference is, of course, in the new covenant fulfillment because we see everything the old covenant was pointing toward which was Jesus, but we see more. We see more of the Spirit's work, more people being saved, more of the outpouring to give power and strength to do the Great Commission. But really, the work is, is identical. So when I read this, think about not just what's going on in the New Covenant, but also in the Old Covenant, and what the Lord does in the heart of any to bring them to Himself. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 27. <clears throat> for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Notice the, the new heart, the new spirit, the new desire to serve the Lord. By the way, don't get tripped up by the fact that he says, I'm going to take away a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's not saying, okay, I'm going to take away a, a, a more corrupt heart and give you a less corrupt heart. You know, because we usually talk about the flesh as being corruption. But he's, he's, in this case, it means a regenerate heart. Your heart wasn't beating for me at all. It was a heart of stone. But now I'm giving you a heart of flesh. Now you will love me and you will serve me. And as I've said, he's talking about the blessing of the new covenant, which was also given to old covenant believers. And this blessing is the blessing where the Spirit of God comes into our souls and he takes the law of God and he writes it upon our hearts, which is what the author to the Hebrews quoting Jeremiah says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the blessing of the new birth. And that's what turns us to Christ to trust in Him and gives us the ability to obey Him. Okay. Now, one thing we don't want to get confused about here, which another group of Christians are very confused on, we don't want to confuse the wording here when he speaks about Israel. Okay, this is the covenant I'm going to make with Israel, with my people. He's not speaking here of ethnic Israel, of people who are the natural-born children of Abraham. He's talking about spiritual Israel, those who will truly believe God's elect, the sheep, the children of the promise, and, and why do I say that? Because of what Paul says in Romans 9, verses 6 through 8, when he's, he's you know, looking at the fact that the majority of ethnic Israel is not trusting in the Messiah, in Jesus who's come. Why? Has God's promise failed? Well, it would have if that promise, the one we just read, applied to ethnic Israel. But it doesn't. It applies to spiritual Israel. It applies to all within ethnic Israel and all among the nations or the Gentiles that actually will believe in Jesus. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 9, verses 6 through 8. They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So who is the true Israel? 
the children of the promise, those whom God has chosen um, and has given his Holy Spirit. So we believe, okay, we obey. We've trusted Jesus. We're following him because God chose us, because God sent his son to die for us, because he gave us his Holy Spirit to change our hearts so that we would come willingly to him. By the way, that was Jesus' confidence as well. You know, Jesus, as he was ministering throughout Israel in those three years, the, there was a time when there were great crowds following him, but he knew the vast majority of them actually didn't believe in him. And, you know, that, that could be discouraging, couldn't it? Especially if you happen to know that. You know, I look at thousands of people. You know those 5,000 people that were fed with the loaves and fish? They left, and the only ones who stayed were the 12, and one of them wasn't a true believer. One of them was a devil, and Jesus knew that. And so as he saw the huge crowd that were following, you know, and then he saw them leave, his encouragement to himself was simply this, all that the Father gives me will come to me. You know, he, he knew there were those that would come, even though there were many who didn't. So Jesus knew these truths, of course, comforted himself with these truths. Now, one last point, the remonstrance also insisted that even if you trust in Jesus, you can still eventually fall away and be lost eternally. In other words, they didn't believe in what we could crassly call eternal security. Um, we do believe in that. We believe that's the case. But listen to what they say. And this one is a little bit longer than the others. Hopefully, it won't be hard to follow. This is their last point. Those who are, who are united to Christ by a true faith and have become partakers of his life-giving spirit have full power to strive against Satan's sin, the world, and their own flesh, and to win the victory. And that Christ assists them through his spirit in all temptations, extends to them his hand, and if only they are ready for the conflict and desire his help and are not inactive, it keeps them from falling so that they cannot be misled or plucked out of Christ's hand by any craft or power of Satan, according to the word of God. I know I must have read that wrong because it doesn't make sense to me as I'm reading it. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, I don't want to try to read that again. I'll just summarize it. But let me read the last part because that's the most important part. But whether they can through negligence, forsaking the beginning of their life in Christ, returning to this present evil world, turning away from the holy doctrine which was delivered to them, losing a good conscience and becoming devoid of grace, that must be more proven from Holy Scripture before we can teach it with the full persuasion of our mind. In other words, we, we doubt that. Okay. So what the first part of this was saying was simply this. He will keep us if we hold on to him by his grace. But we can lose that grace and lose our grip and turn away from him and perish forever. Now the question we want to ask is this. Does the Bible teach that true believers can ultimately fall away completely to the point where they are lost forever? Well, Paul writes in Philippians 1, verse 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That was Paul's confidence, that if he began the work, he's going to complete the work. Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 29, which is a part of our text regarding my sheep. Again, listen. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. I, I don't know if you can get it any, any more clearly. I mean, can you say it any more clearly than that? I give them life eternal. They will never perish. He goes on to say, of course, that no one can take them away from the Father who has given them to him. And then Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 8, 30 and following. And these whom he predestined. Now again, we, we saw what um, uh, those, I should say, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Okay, remember foreknowledge. 
has to do with foreloving, not just foreknowing what we're going to do, but foreloving us. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. These whom he predestined, he also called. And by the way, that call is the effectual call of the Holy Spirit that brings the sheep to Jesus. He called them. And these whom he called, he also justified because this calling brings with it the new birth, which gives you the ability to trust in Jesus. And so when you are called effectually by the Holy Spirit, you immediately trust in Jesus and that brings justification, which means we are declared to be righteous and acceptable in Jesus Christ. And these whom he justified, he also glorified, which means he brought them to heaven. I want you to notice two things. He's speaking about everything in the past tense. You know, he, he sees it as a done deal. Okay, this has already took him, taken place. Remember how Paul says in Ephesians 2, that the Ephesians and we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We're, we're already there because we are united to the Christ, to Jesus, who is there already. Okay? And that's what he's talking about here. As Jesus has been glorified in heaven, so being in Christ, we are already with him in heaven glorified. It, it's a done deal. Okay? So that's how certain it is. But notice, secondly, when he says, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, those whom he predestined, he called, those whom he called, he justified, those whom he justified, he glorified, that each subsequent step picks up everyone from the first step. You know, we can put it this way, all whom he foreknew, he also predestined. All whom he predestined, he called. All whom he called, he justified. All whom he justified, he glorified. Paul picks up the group and, and moves them all along from beginning to end, which means that none whom the Lord has foreloved will ever fail to make it to glorification. Nobody slips through the cracks here. Okay. Now, the Remonstrants and the Arminians see salvation from beginning to end as a work that we and God do together. God is working with us, but we have a good deal of work to do ourselves. God gives us, He gives everyone grace. By that grace, we believe. Through that faith, we take hold of Christ and we obey. And if we endure to the end, then we'll be saved. Okay? That sounds an awful lot like Roman Catholicism to me. The only difference is where you get your grace. Okay? But on this view, God gets part of the credit and we get part of the credit because part of it depended on us to make it to the end and to trust. Remember, we could resist the grace and not trust. Having trusted, we can still fall away, so we have to endure. There's a lot we have to do in order to make it to the end. But Calvinists see this as God's work from beginning to end. God chooses us. He sends His Son for us. He gives us His Holy Spirit to enable us to believe, make us alive. He justifies us right then through the righteousness of His Son as that righteousness is imputed to us, credited to us, and our sins are, are basically canceled out by His death on the cross. That's when we actually get the benefit of His death. Uh, so we are justified through His righteousness. He enables us, He enables us to persevere in holiness until the end of our lives. Why is it that none that trust in Jesus are actually going to make it to the end? It's because God gives them the grace to persevere. It's not the perseverance of the sinner. We're not, we're not saying, because Arminians might accuse us of saying something like this, but what you're saying is, you can believe in Jesus, live any way you want, and still make it to heaven. No, that isn't the case, because if you say you believe in Jesus and you're living an ungodly life, that means you've never actually come to know Jesus, because remember what the blessing of the new covenant is? I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and you will obey me, okay? So that's the evidence that we belong to him. So there will be obedience either way, but the obedience we're talking about is the fruit of the Spirit's work in us and the love we have for the Lord because we're already justified. We know we're, we're, we're going to make it to the end. We know we're going to make it to heaven. And so we serve the Lord out of thankfulness and love for all that he's given to us. We're not, as it were, just kind of you know, getting into it and, and doing our very, very best to hang on to the end. Because if I don't, I'm going to end up falling into the pit of hell. That, that's quite a different view. 
Okay? Now, this view, or what we think is the biblical view, doesn't give us any of the glory. It really gives God all the glory. Now, the Lord tells us in Isaiah 42, verse 8, and 48, verse 11, that He will not give His glory the credit for anything that good that is done. He'll give, he'll give the credit for the wickedness to the wicked people and to wicked you know, beings and so forth. But for everything good that is done, God gets all the glory. He will not give that glory. He will not give that credit to another. And so we need to make sure, especially when it comes to salvation, but whatever, whatever we do that might be good, you know, that, that the Lord enables us to do, we need to make sure that we give Him all the glory. God gets all the glory for our redemption because He is the one who has done it all. So let's not take any of the credit to ourselves, which again is what this other view does. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and um, let's prepare to, um, well, let, let's pray that God would help us to receive what we just heard and to apply it by way of, of course, giving Him glory. But let's also prepare to come to the table as, uh, as we are praying silently. And after we've prayed for a couple of moments, then I'll close us.